Family team, we are so glad that you are joining us for Hope today, where we love to give you a future and a hope and the hope of glory, Jesus Christ. I'm Sydney Goldman here with Tom Hollis and Anna Fry. You know, Tom, it is Friday, and we just love bringing the joy of the Lord to the TV. We do, we especially love bringing it on Friday. Why not, right? It's, <laughs> it's a great time to bring uh, God's love. Uh, you know, every day is one that when we wake up, we should be glad that we serve God, that we love him, Anna, and that we have that relationship with him. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you what, I have been working from home all week long, maybe, and many of you have been at home all week long, and it's so good to come together and encourage one another and talk about God's word. And so we're really praying and hoping that today's show will fill your spirit and draw you closer to the Lord. That, that's a big thing, that working from home right now. I mean, huge companies are saying that we're just going to have everybody stay at home and work from home at least until 2021. And you know, I'm not that person. I'm like, I got to come in. I got to have my coffee at, home, at, at in my office. I like interacting with people. Tom. Well, you know, I'm kind of like, I think I'm a hybrid. So I really enjoy like I've been did like coming into the studio, being able to do the show and then going from home, working from home. So I think I get like the creativity juices. So I'll go to a park or sit in the trees and I get really inspired. So I know a lot of us are working from home a lot. You know, so it's, it's a new normal, right? Did you but say sit in the trees? I mean, I guess, did I say sit in the trees? I mean, I look at the Does trees. Everybody see Sydney up in a tree in uh, at a local yes. park. Could you please send us a copy of that. We would like that. Well, <laughs> moving on here, we have a verse for you today. As always, we love to start the program with a verse. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Famous verse there. Any thoughts? Oh man, I love this verse so much because it is true that whenever we follow Christ's teachings that it will set us free. And there's this strategy. So one thing that I feel like I'm bound to or that I can be bound to is fear. And very practically speaking, I had to come up with a strategy when I felt like I was getting in that bondage. And you can do this at home too. It's very simple. It works every time. Speak truth, pray truth, and live truth. So even like, for example, this morning, I opened up my Bible to Second Timothy and I saw one of my favorite verses that we have not been given a spirit of timidity, right. but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And so I just begin speaking that out loud and praying and thanking God for the Holy Spirit that he's given us. That is the spirit that we live by. And so that we can go out and do what he has called us to do. And so just to speak the truth louder than the lies will That's set really us free. Good. And suddenly those chains of fear, the chains of guilt or shame are gone. And I like thank you so much for your transparency and just talking about some of the things that we're struggling with because we know a lot of you right now, it is not an easy season. Mm -hmm. You know, we're walking in a new normal. What does that even look like? We don't know what the days look like ahead, but we know that the truth of Jesus, that when we rest in him, when we go into the secret place, into his presence, he will truly set us free and calm us down and give us the peace that we need. And if that's you today and you're just battling some things, you know, you're wrestling with anxiety and stress and different things that are rising up in your life, just give us a call at our prayer line. We're always here for you at 888 Six six five four four. Eight, three. Now, you know, speaking of, you know, the new normal that we're in, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has turned life truly upside down in a lot of way. And there's growing concern over the mental health condition of our nation. A new report from the Commonwealth Fund found Americans are experiencing more emotional and mental turmoil, and listen to this, Tom and Anna, than any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the survey found this, that one third of adults reported experiencing stress, anxiety, and great sadness. That's difficult to cope with when they're by themselves. You know, a lot of people the social distancing, they're by themselves, it's really tough. And only one in three were able to get help from a professional. More than 30% face negative economic impacts due to the pandemic. And you know, I just think it's so important. You know, we wanna bring this to you because, you know, Tom, it's a lot of people are just like struggling and I think we can't be silent about the things that we're going through because this is the stress and the anxiety that we're dealing with. It's, it's not just, you know, one person, it's well, a lot of us. Stress has come to us. You know, the, it, it, it's, it's nice to say, well, eliminate stress in your life. Well, I haven't found the way to do that yet. What we have to do is figure out how that we deal with stress. And of course, through the scriptures, through the truth that we were yeah. just talking about, you know, I have written in the corner of my Bible here, right next to that verse, the truth makes us what we are not. And yeah. so we are not in ourselves able to deal with all these things. 
but through Christ, through the strength of him and godly counsel and, and professional help too yeah. if you need it. It's not, not, not anything wrong. You would go to a doctor for a physical problem. There's certainly no problem going to some professional for a mental issue as well. Yeah. And I'm such a big advocate of mental health. You know, get a professional, seek out Christian counseling. It's amazing. I'm taking part of it myself and it has done wonders in my life. All right, so moving on, I just wanna ask you a question and Tom and Anna, I wanna know your, your opinions too. What's the first thing you're gonna do when you walk through the gates of heaven? Hmm. Well, for this one, Father, this is what he plans to do. Take a look. Gates of heaven? I'm sorry, I didn't cut Oh, it might be. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I gosh, when I walk through the gates of heaven, who knows what we're gonna yeah. do? Just like look around and awe, take it all in and fall at the feet of Jesus. I just man. It's well, amazing. you know, I, I, it's it's something that we will be beyond anything that we could ask or think. You know, the, we we don't even know what heaven's gonna be like. We always the number one thing is he is going to be there. Right. Jesus is going to be there. That's where the joy comes. Well, guys, uh, the coronavirus, as we just were discussing, has affected area, every area of our life, health, relationships, the pocketbook. And we have a lot of people calling in for prayer regarding their financial impact uh, of the COVID-19 crisis. And so we wanted to talk uh, with someone who has a better understanding of the economic impact. Jerry Boyer is a financial economist, author, editor for Town Hall Finance, commentator on everything. Jerry, I love that. He's a longtime friend of Cornerstone. Jerry, welcome to Hope Today. Great to be with you, if, if only from a distance. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's one of the things that is all new to us. And I, before we talk about finance, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, we were talking about stress. I know that that's in the church as well. This situation, Actually, all of 2020 has been a year, uh, as I like to say, we would not have signed up for if it had been presented to us. What do you think uh, God is trying to get us to see during this time that we're all going through? Well, I think that's the right question to ask. You know, um, what is God trying to get us to see? What's, what's his plan? Uh, because this isn't something that took God by surprise, and it wasn't something that God's like struggling to cope with. Um, and is beyond his ability to, to understand. Uh, this is something that in some sense is in his plan. You know, Christians disagree about how much he's actively planning versus allowing, but there's no version of Christianity where God doesn't have a comprehensive plan. And I think that these kind of adversities are there for our good um, and one of the things they do, and you quoted from John 8, you know, the truth shall set you free, is even when the enemy comes against us, even though he's the father of lies, somehow in God's providence, we end up learning the truth because the enemy is good at finding our weak spots and goes after our weak spots. And then we know our weak spots. So this, uh, this, this attack on us reveals things about us, which gives us that gives us a place to look and say, "Oh, I see. There's there's an area where I was weak, um, and I can and I can be helped, and I can turn to God for help in whatever area this is." So we get truth about ourselves, even hard truth. We might have thought we were more grounded than we were. Um, and we find out we're not grounded. We might've thought that we were, say, you were talking about mental health, emotionally healthy. And it's like, hmm, maybe I wasn't as resilient as I always, maybe I thought that I was tough and strong and resilient and, you know, uh, you know, a month of not seeing people has reduced me to tears, right? I'm not as strong as I thought I was. So in that weakness, that, the, the revelation of that weakness is then the opportunity for us to turn that weakness over to God's strength. Jerry, I want to ask you your perspective. You know, the big debate right now is the mask, no mask controversy, you know, in the church. Some people are for it, some people are against it. What do you have to say? What I have to say is that the devil is not pro-mask and the devil is not anti-mask. The devil is pro-us fighting about masks. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think that 
when when Christians flame one another on social media or in personal conversations about masks, that's a good day for the devil. And when we disagree about masks and reason with one another um, and love one another, even if we disagree, and maybe even go further and get to truth, because there really are answers about whether masks prevent this disease or not, I happen to think that masks, you know, the data is that they prevent about 70% of transmission. Um, and uh, so I, some, some people are angry at me right now. You know, it's all a conspiracy. Okay, fine. Just love me anyway, and I'll love you. So it used to be the church was the place where you came together to get truth. I don't think that happens right now. But at least for now, can we be the place where you come together to get love? So that if we're disagreeing about every little question on planet Earth, mask, no mask, um, and, you know, shut down, no shut down, uh, uh, you know, which political party, et cetera, at least the church can, if we can't be the place, the honest place where you come together and we're the best ones at getting to the truth, let's at least be the place that when we can't agree on truth, we can agree on loving one another and keep the relationships intact. Do not destroy or let be destroyed any relationship in your life through this pandemic. In fact, if you come through this pandemic and your relationships are stronger, then this was a victory for you. This was a victory for the church and it was a defeat for the devil. Yeah, that's so good, Jerry. It makes me think about how there's so much talk about how our world is out of control, or our relationships are out of control, but we need to remember that there are still things in our control. What are some of those things that are still in our control that we can use to work on those relationships? Well, what we, what's in our control is the, our tongue, how we talk um, to each other, about each other, and how we talk in general. We can be people who's, who are peaceful in our speech, uh, and we can be reconcilers in our speech, or the tongue can be a fire. You know, Jesus said that if you say you fool, if you say Raka, you're in danger of going to the council. If you say you 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 fool, you're in danger of uh, hellfire, of Gehenna, literally Gehenna. We say hellfire, but you know, Jesus's direct reference was the garbage dump outside the you know the temple, you know, out in Jerusalem, you know, off the cliff. Um, and then later on, Jesus's younger brother James wrote a letter, um, which was largely about how we speak. And he, used, he also used that analogy about your speech being like fire. He said the tongue is a fire, which sets the whole world on flame. And what happened is that's exactly what happened. And James, James was talking about that, which Jesus warned about what happened, that the rhetoric would get out of control, uh, people's tongues would get out of control. It's 20 years worth, worse at the time James is writing. Um, and 40, 40 years after that, 30 years after that, it had gotten so bad that Jerusalem literally was burning in a civil war and an attack from the Romans. And the last thing that happens is the Romans go through the temple and all the people with the, all the fiery tongue people who took control of the temple were pushed out of the temple, off of the cliff, down into Gehenna, down into the fiery garbage dump that Jesus uses as an analogy for hell. Um, so this is practical advice. Just don't just watch how you talk. He who guards his lips guards his life. Every time you're about to talk, and by the way, it's not just mouths. Now we have keyboards. So Jesus <laughs> didn't talk about fingers, and 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 um, and James didn't talk about fingers. But now it's mostly fingers. Uh, what is that? What what are you doing with your keyboard? Are you increasing the hope and love in the world, or are you toxically adding to the anxiety and hate? Um, and I think. Any of us do an honest, say, social media moral evaluation, we can see that, you know, we're a little uncomfortably on the other side of Matthew 521 through 522 in terms of Raqqa and, and calling people fools. But the church can sow in the opposite direction. Um, and so a conscious effort to talk differently is extremely important. In some sense, it's almost more important than a conscious effort to think differently because you'll, your thoughts will kind of follow your speech in some way. Um, so when you're watching how you talk, then you have to stop and think about how you're gonna talk, which means you're thinking. And what would Jesus have me to do? And, wh and how about Jesus's warnings? And what, how can we have the ministry of reconciliation in a time? We're, we're not ready to be the sons of God who the world needs us to be entirely right now, who can solve the coronavirus, 
and speak true and speak, you know, truth. And we, we know whether masks work and which ones are the best. We're not there yet. The church is sort of, even though we're 2000 years old, in some sense, we're kind of an immature church now in terms of challenges like this, but we can still love, right? If, we, if, if maybe we don't have super amounts of wisdom, we can still love. And that's the first thing anyway. So we can at least be a place that people can come to for love and we can turn down the heat uh, and maybe even turn up the light a little bit. You know, Jerry, we're going to have to have you come back to talk about finances. <laughs> we're going to, we're definitely going to have you back real soon because we're running out of time here. But before we uh, uh, end this segment, um, I've heard it said, and I, I've, uh, a casual study of some of the, the movements of revival and awakening in the church seem to follow a pandemic. It seemed like those kind of things helped to uh, kind of, I guess, dismiss all the things that people were relying on and they're having to seek after God. And we're seeing part of that in our, in our world today. Yeah, pandemics, uh, earthquakes, wars. There was a revival after the Napoleonic Wars. There have been revivals after pandemics. I mean, because when the things that, um, when the world shakes, the things that can't, that can be shaken tumble. And the things that can't be shaken remain. So then people look around and they say, what remained and what crashed? And what remains is Christ and his church and his movement here on earth. So we, Part of us, part of what we do is we get through this, keep the relationships intact, uh, improve our finances and our health. I mean, be more, be, let, be more ready for things like this and then be the people that people can turn to when we rebuild. I'm almost not thinking about the pandemic much anymore. We're, we're coming out of the economic recession really quickly. Um, I'm more thinking about what is the rebuilding on the other side? We are rebuilders. We are Nehemiah and Ezra people. Uh, what is the rebuilding going to be like? How are we getting ready? And even now starting the rebuilding from the pandemic that you know seems to have peaked, um, at least so far epidemiologically. Now it can always come up again, but the, you know, the largest numbers are, uh, the highest numbers of the disease are in the past and the lowest numbers in the economy are in the past. We're in the recovery phase, certainly economically. I'm not an expert on pandemics, but economics is my expertise. We're definitely in a recovery phase. So let's be forward looking. Hey, you saw, you, it's a hope and a future. Mm -hmm. All right, so how are we, who rebuilt the world after Rome fell? Uh, monks and just ordinary Christians um, rebuilt and created Europe by rebuilding after Rome fell. So something, a lot fell. How are we the rebuilders after that? That's kind of where I'm focused right now. Mm -hmm. That is so good, Jerry. I appreciate you so much and uh, what you uh, bring when you, whenever you share with us. We will have you back sometime soon. We can get a little bit more into finances, but thank you so much for being with us. Always a pleasure and an honor. God bless. Well, when we come back from this short break, the lies young women believe and the truth that sets them free, a new True You segment right after this break. Here at Cornerstone TV, we depend on your support to provide inspiring, life-changing programs. As a way of saying thank you, we want to send you Keys to Powerful Prayer by best-selling author Stormy Omardian. Receive this small pocket book along with Chosen, a 30-day devotional for your best gift. To give, call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org. Request Keys to Powerful Prayer and reignite your prayer life today. Welcome to True You, where we'll talk about becoming the truest version of who God created you to be. I'm your host and the co-author of Lies Young Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free, Dana Gresh. 
The average teen girl scores as high on anxiety tests as those admitted for inpatient treatment in the 1950s. And that's just one of a myriad of emotions you could be in bondage to. Do you suffer from negative feelings that just never go away? Chronic negative, overwhelming emotions could be evidence that you've believed a lie. And today, we'll help you learn the difference between a healthy emotion or one that's trying to warn you that something's really wrong. Here at the Round Table of True You, no topic is off limits. I'm Stacy Rudolph, lead teacher at True You, and today we are gonna be tackling a big topic, chronic negative emotions. They could be a sign that you're believing a lie. Let's take a look at one girl's story of her battle with negative emotions. Hey you guys, it's Alina Pitts here. I hope you're doing well. Um, so one of the main emotions that I've struggled with for a lot of my life has been anxiety. Anxiety has always been this like feeling of like tightness in my chest and then also just this constant fear and worry. Um, and about two years ago, it hit its peak. Um, I had had a panic attack um, in the middle of school and I didn't recognize it as that because it's embarrassing. I was like, why am I not breathing? But I soon came to realize through um, the loss of my appetite and a lot of other really hard things um, that I was believing a lie. And the lie I was believing was that God was not in control. And that lie took me down spirals of worry and anxiety and just constant fear. Um, but I found freedom. I still deal with anxiety, but now I have freedom. And I always know like God's in control. He's got me. Um, and I promise if you feel these things as well, I promise you there's freedom for you too. You may recognize that beautiful face. Alina Pitts is an actress and starred in the movie War Room. She's also an author of her own set of fiction books. Alina, you describe so perfectly that feeling, what you feel like when anxiety just grips you. Now, do you know what triggered that battle for you? Um, so I've always just had that tightness in my chest for as long as I can remember, and I kind of just learned to live with it. Um, but about two years ago, my mom suddenly passed away within like two hours, no warning. Um, and that was like the epitome of being out of control, which I've always, I've never been in control. God's always been in control. Um, but I think I thought that I was in control. And so that was just like the like warning sign, like, hey, you're not in control at all. So you had this emotion that was kind of always there, this chronic negative emotion, but then it got into full throttle yeah. when you faced actually something that you did need to have it would be appropriate for you to have negative emotions yeah. about a loss that significant. But you didn't have really the right measure of that anxiety or, anxiety or grief. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. So you knew something was wrong. It was like an alarm system mm -hmm. or what would you call it, Stacy? Well, I like to call it like a check engine light, you know? Oh, yeah. It lets you know something is up and that you need to look deeper and see what it is. But um, I think a lot of times we let emotions rule us. So you want to be careful not to let your feelings dictate your life and guide what you're doing and everything because you want to dive into God's word and find that truth that's actually more firm than your emotions. Yeah, so. because emotions are a good tool. Let's, mm -hmm. let's break this down. Emotions are good. Genesis 1 says that everything God created is good. Mm -hmm. So he created our emotions. That right. means that even something like anxiety and stress could be a good tool. Mm -hmm. If you're doing too much and you feel that, that's the check engine light exactly. saying, slow down, girl, right? Yeah. But in your case, it had been so prevalent for so long and then had been triggered into something that admittedly you should feel some sadness and some grief. Horrific experience to lose your mom, who I know you were very close to. But you wanted to tackle it with truth. Yeah. You recognized that lie, I'm not in control. So what truth did God help you discover? Um, well, first off, I'm human. so. I think that I went through a lot before I turned to God's word, but eventually I did, probably when I was like down on my knees, like I don't have anything else to like combat this. Um, and the verse that I've clung to for a really long time is Isaiah 26, three, which just basically says, you keep him in perfect peace mm -hmm. whose eyes are set on you because he trusts in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned that perfect peace on earth will not be like perfect peace in heaven. Like earthly perfect peace is more of like, I feel anxious, I'm not okay, but I'm trusting that God's got me. Wow. I like that yeah. she said that too. That's real, that you didn't initially go to God's word. Yeah. We are human. We are going to yeah. think we can handle it on our own or try to do everything we can. And sometimes we use God's word as like a last resort. Yeah. But I like that you were honest about that. That's but, real. But we want to we challenge you yes. to get to God's word because that's yes. where you're truly going to find the answer. Our key verse here at True You is John 8, 31 and 32. Can I read that? Yeah. It says, um, 
Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You lived that out, Alina. You, you abided in God's word. When your emotions were out of whack, you abided in God's word. You discovered the truth you needed and it set you free. I love that and that's what we want you to experience too. Yes, if you find yourself just struggling with constant negative emotions, let me give you the first step in overcoming them. You need to tell someone. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. I want you to stop and talk to someone. Find the wisest older woman you know in your life and just tell her like it is, I am drowning in depression. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly overwhelmed with stress and anxiety. And together you guys can dig into God's word to find the truth to replace those lies. And that'll help you be the truest you you could ever be. Mm -hmm. If you enjoyed today's conversation, we invite you to join us online for a deeper discussion at liesyoungwomenbelieve.com. We'd also love for you to send us your one minute video freedom story. Get all the details on our website. Thanks for joining us today. Be the true you, because God created a masterpiece when he made you. Till next time. I am just so thankful that Dana and her team are facing this topic. I live in a world of teenagers and I'm seeing the reality of this play out with friend, my kids' friends in the hospital um, with suicide attempts or with cutting self-harm. And I, I think what we need to take away as adults is that we would lead this next generation well, that we would deal with our stuff so that we can set an example and love them well. That is so true. And it's so easy for us to say, well, you know, it's not just kids will be kids or teenagers will be teenagers. There are some serious life-threatening problems that come. Sydney, we just have about 30 seconds. Yeah. Would you lead us in prayer for, yeah. for our, our prayer requests? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for every person that has called and I thank you for every person that's watching, Father God. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that today that you would search their hearts and know their anxieties, Father God, and they would cast their burdens upon you, Father God, because we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, wonderful show today. A lot of important topics that we covered. Thank you, ladies, for being here with us. And thank you for being here with us. Uh, we believe that God has got such wonderful things that he wants to do in your life. And we're believing that you are going to find God's hope today, too. Have a great day in him.